Okay, let's get started with lecture number three. Lo and behold, we only have two lectures left, so it's not too bad. So we'll have this lecture, we'll take another little break, then we'll finish up with inheritance, and then we'll be done for today, uh, which is a lot of progress. Actually, we've done an entire three weeks-ish. Hmm. And with that, I think I went through a little bit more examples on the website, on the, the weekday class, but it's no problem. All right, so object creation, we've actually seen a lot of this stuff already. And that's one of the benefits we have of having this intense back-to-back -back kind of format because it wasn't last week. It was like five minutes ago we, we talked about this. Uh, so object creation, here we have the class body. Uh, this is a semicolon that got word wrapped, I think, down here. It looks like it. So I see uh, the class is called body. There's two data members in here. We have private integer. Excuse me, we have private long, which is a data type, uh, ID number, private string name, so it's going to be equal to empty. And then we have private body orbits, and then we have private uh, static long, which is the same example we saw before. So it's a pretty basic class. And uh, just to tell you, you know, specifically, because I've kind of rushed through it, but to give you this format specifically, when we design a variable sun to refer to the body objects, this is how we're getting this body space sun. And I've been calling this a data type. It really is. It's an object data type. And the object data type is body of this particular class. So we say, when we say body, space, sun, this is the name of the object that we're creating an instance of. And then we're always using new body. And if we don't have any parameters, we just put new with empty, empty parameters. So the ways we, we create an instance with setting it parameters. And, um, and you know, in terms of design, there's pros and cons. If you uh, don't put anything in, your default constructor is going to want to set some initial values to those variables. If it's not, then it's really not, I mean, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. Some people don't like to use a default constructor. Some people just want the, them to be created and it's just extra work. It doesn't really matter how many lines of code and how many different constructors and how much stuff you have in there. It doesn't take up any extra or less memory. It takes basically about the same amount of space for every object is reserved, essentially, from the JVM. The JVM kind of does that just so that it just automatically, oh, new object, new object, just, just takes and allocates space so that it can deallocate it, and it always has enough available, so it'll manage its own environment. So the object is created by the uh, new method. The runtime system allocates enough memory to store that new object. And if no space is there, uh, available, then it will do an automatic um, garbage collection. You will occasionally get the out-of-memory error. Depends on what kind of device you're running on. If you're creating an Android phone application, as an example, and it's a huge application, you will occasionally, I do occasionally get out of memory errors on that platform. And the good thing about Java is it's Java. And the same thing you write for this platform, you can write for that platform for that one. And depending on what you're doing, you might be writing an application that may not necessarily be appropriate. So you might end up with having to play around with it a little bit. In that case, then you have to start thinking about, well, you know, what can I get rid of? Well, you know, how can I streamline this a little bit more? And then, you know, looking at things. Uh, so no need to delete explicitly, as I mentioned before. So that's kind of a summary of some of the things we've looked at already. And here's another kind of a summary, because we've talked about this already, um, in terms of the constructor. So in terms of the terminology, the constructor is invoked automatically when the object is returned by new. And if the object is returned, when we say new, create this, it returns something but there's no value that gets returned. It gets assigned to a particular object variable that we've created of that type, which is why we say the type space, the name of the variable equals the new, and then we say the, you know, the constructor or whatever it is that we're creating of that particular new. We're running, a, running that method. It has the same name as the class as we've seen so far, and we can have as many uh, access modifiers as the class members. We can have as many as we want. Um, Similar to methods, the constructor is just nothing more than another method by terminology. So the one that doesn't take on any values is the default one. Sometimes, uh, actually, Java doesn't like to call it a default. Actually, I see it down here. It provides default non-argument constructor. Sometimes they call it a non-argument constructor. Mm, I, I think from a C++ days, I, I like to, the term default. It makes a lot more sense to me, but not technically called that. Constructors have no return type, um, so you don't want to give it a return type. Because if you give it a return type, it's different. It doesn't match the same class. It's different. So 
you can actually give it a return type and have a method that you're calling with the same name as the class name. Uh, which can be, yeah? Can you please tell me uh, what's the difference between the constructed and constructor and a method? Um, a constructor is a method, and the difference is that the constructor has the same name as the class type, and it doesn't return a value. It's usually void, and it has, in fact, do I have it in here? No. I had it in one of the other examples. I might have it. Oh, here's one, actually. Um, nope, it's not in here. Oh, right, here we go, body. Body's in bold. We've left out public, we've left out private, we've left out all of the access modifiers. But it's a, um, it's a method, just like any of the other methods, but it has the same name as the class name. So if this class body, we have two constructors here. The one without any parameters is the default. So in that one, if you don't specify any parameters, that one will run automatically. And the way that the other ones are invoked is it depends on how many and what order you give the parameters. And when to use constructor and when to use method? You always use all of them. <laughs> um, you use a constructor when you want to initialize something when the new instance is created. It's kind of like doing a declaration and an initialization all in the same shot. It's like when you say integer i is equal to 10. That's what a constructor does. It's going to say i is equal to 10. Um, you don't have to. In fact, there's a lot of people that don't like to use the constructors. In fact, they create methods for everything. And, or they sit you can, up here when you initialize the variables. You can say i is equal to 10 or something. In fact, here we have a next id is equal to 0. You don't actually have to use the constructor for that. We also have this thing called initialization, which is non-constructor code, but it's initialized and it's run with each new instance of each class that's created. And I'll show you that actually coming up in the next couple of slides, not to be confused with a constructor. We have more options. So, yes? Uh, can we have the private access modifier for a constructor? Can a constructor be private? It cannot be private. It has to be public. Because private won't be accessible outside of the class. So is it a rule that it doesn't accept private? Or, uh, I mean, if we do oh, it'll accept it? anything. The problem is it just won't work. <laughs> it won't function. Well, that's one of the interesting things about Java, and I'll, let me go back to this slide. I think I covered everything in that slide, actually. Okay, so the interesting thing is it'll allow anything, and it's the logic, because there are some cases in which you might want it private. Um, not something that we've talked about yet, but when we get on, in through inheritance and building classes, we may not want that constructor to go off unless it's, you know, or, or, or actually, the other interesting thing that people like to do is they like to create methods that invoke constructors, that act like constructors, but they're methods because they don't want it to fire off automatically. And uh, let me bump ahead a little bit, actually. When we <coughs> build a class from a class, when we talk about inheritance, all the constructors go off all the way through to the base. So there might be a case where we don't want to use a constructor <laughs> if we don't want to automatically set the behavior. But the concept is we use the constructor to automate the assignment of those variables. And the idea is we want to, audit, we want, we want to assign values. Otherwise, why are the variables in the class? And everything for this particular you know, class should be inside of the class. And so if we use the constructor, we sort of follow all of the rules in terms of assigning the default values, setting and constructing the base properly, and then we construct the extended one on top of that. So we can kind of use the same concept. So it really, at this point, you just kind of have to take some of the stuff at face value. And then as we go for, through the course and we start looking at inheritance, when we start looking at inheritance, that one, all of this stuff makes more sense. <laughs> because then you go back and say, oh, well, this is what composes this object, and the constructor does that. And then this is what composes this object. That constructor goes off, plus we have this that's being set. Because we've extended, we've specialized this class a little bit. So now we have this new variable that we're also setting at the same time. And then we have this class here <laughs> that extends off of this class that's going to add even more functionality to it. So a lot of this stuff is kind of laying the foundation for building uh, building a hierarchy, building a hierarchy of classes. And the whole base classes, everything in the language is done this way. This is how we build our hierarchy of our, our intelligence. And when I start talking about inheritance, I think a lot of it will probably make more sense to you in terms of what's going on. 
<clears throat> All right, so the sample class and the constructors here, I kind of bumped ahead, but I, I've already gone through the example. We have two. One of them takes on different parameters. Constructors are setting the values for the data members, for the fields. Assume no, no, uh, no any body object is constructed before any body. Hmm. Well, we have body sun is equal to new body. We have the ID zero. The name's empty. The orbit's null. Set automatic. I'll talk about null later on in the course in terms of uh, object comparisons and stuff. And the net ID is equal to one uh, because here we have in this body we have ID number is uh, incrementing. If you're not familiar with the plus plus notation, if you're not, uh, that's where the deedle and deedle text comes into play. It's a basic basic programming concept. Same thing as in C and C plus <coughs> plus. Okay, so assume no other. Uh, no anybody object has been constructed, but now we're going to run the constructor two different times. We're going to create body sun and body uh, earth, two different objects, and we're going to send it two different parameters. Now we have two separate, oops, now we have two separate objects with two separate um, sets of values. It's, what this slide is showing you is how the, um, the values are set differently and how next ID is incremented automatically um, when each one of them is run. So. We have, what the um, interesting thing is, is we have the default constructor that goes off automatically even when we have the other constructors going off. So you want to be careful with like, where you're placing your information <clears throat> because you could override it if you want to or you could select and just say, well, I'm going to put the next ID++ in here and I'm not going to put it in any of my other constructors because this is going to go off automatically. So we're going to have next ID 1, next ID 1, next ID 2, next ID 3, so we're going to have an incremental um, value that's going to go on there. So You may also have noticed this call to this up here. Um, this is when you don't want to put this dot name, this dot orbits, this dot is it. If you just want to say one blanket call, say this. Meaning we're talking about this object right here and we're setting the variables for everything associated with this. That's more consistent than what I did before when I typed in this dot something, this dot something. You can do it both ways. The only thing is, is when we get, we have super that we'll look at. Super is easier than going super dot this, super dot that, this dot that. You just go this, super. <laughs> it kind of just sets the environment for you. This is making a call to this object. And it's saying, right now, these variables. Because when we start looking at inheritance in the next slide uh, set coming up, we're going we're gonna to essentially see how that works in terms of the contrast. So using of this inside a constructor, you can use this to invoke another constructor in the same class. So this is what took this. We called to this, so we have index. We have ID number constructor, the default constructor going off for this particular class. And uh, this is called explicit constructor invocation. Because uh, we're calling ourself from ourself. So it must be the first statement in the constructor body if it exists. So we've stuck it right here in the constructor body as the first statement, which means go ahead and execute this one too. So we're explicitly calling the default constructor when we say this. It also works to identify variables from within this, from within ourselves, as we've seen earlier in my other example. And it can also be used as a reference here, it is here, to the current object. It cannot be used as a static method because this is us. Static is everybody else. Static is, is like shared among all different instances of all different classes. The two of them kind of contradict each other. So you can't put it, you can't use it inside of a static method. If you put this inside of a static, you know, you use them together. I don't even know if the compiler is going to complain, that, but the logic's not going to make any sense <laughs> in terms of what you're doing. So here's an example usage. <coughs> and uh, this is what I showed you before. The, um, the this in bold, and it's not in bold, this is just to highlight the source code for you. Where we have this.name is equal to name. We don't need it in this particular example unless we're doing uh, anything with inheritance or extending, we don't really need it. In fact, a lot of people like this because it makes it clear, it makes it, um, I don't know, you know, name is equal to name. The compiler will actually pick that up, but it sounds like the same thing. 
right? I mean, so if you use the same names here, most people actually by convention will use different names just because if you leave all the variables with different names, it's easy to see where this came from. Like, oh, this was the parameter information that was sent in, you know, and they'll, they'll call it N1 or O1 or something and O2. <clears throat> but, you know, you may not want to. Uh, in this particular example, it looks like it's a Q here, actually, in Q. But uh, this can be sent as an object as well. So you were sending this to in Q. Body.list.add this. Don't worry about this. <laughs> Don't worry about this at this point. <laughs> I'm going to have more examples with this in the future. Actually, I'll show you this with super. So. But this here, this here is actually not adequately explained in this slide set, I think. But we'll see it when we start passing, and that won't happen until next interactive session. So, Other initialization methods. So remember I said uh, when I was answering your question, I said we can have other initialization outside of constructors that has nothing to do with the constructor. If we don't want to mess around with constructors, this is okay to use, but it's not what I would call uh, standard. Um, as an example, without the initialization block here, we can have it in here. This is where we set that number, if you remember rightly. And we put this in here, and we called this from this. <laughs> it's terrible. Here, we left out the constructor. We have an opening, and we have a closing bracket. And it's not, and we don't have to put anything there, because this will happen regardless. The only problem is you can't control it. If you have initialization, and what I mean by initialization is this, any block of code that's put into the class body that's not in a method is going to fire off automatically on every new instance of the class that gets created. And it's going to fire off before any of the constructors fire off. Which means if you want to set something, you can put something in there. I put a comment there. I'm, I'm putting in, people do this for testing all the time. Like, they don't want to have to create an instance and assign all these values. So they'll go ahead and populate out some initial values for testing purposes and then they'll mark it and then they'll remove it in the production code and it's just there for testing. Sometimes they accidentally leave it and you see it, but you know. For the most part, if you want it to work and you don't want to rely on the constructors, you put in this initialization block. Hmm. So the block of statements is initialized. Initialize the fields of the object. These are the fields of the object, the data members. Outside of the member of the, or the construction constructor declaration. They're executed before the body of the constructors are executed. So they happen first. And the order depends. I mean, the order matters when you're trying to figure out troubleshooting. You know, when you're trying to, you know, before that, just in case someone doesn't call the constructor, you can initialize it anyway, kind of thing. Here's another initialization method before. This is the regular old way of doing something. If we want to make it static, we can do it at the class level as well. So here's a static initialization block. And we actually use the keyword static, actually, right before the block. And the block is nothing more than the opening and closing brackets block. Same definition it has in other, other programming um, realms. So it uh, resembles a non-static initialization block, but it's declared with static. So it gets executed when the class is first loaded before any of the constructors fire off. Let's talk about packages. So here's your formal definition of the package concept. And this is another thing you see all over the place. You have package and package and package. And sometimes you see like many different packages all in the same, same file. You want to know how many packages? That's because they can't figure out where anything is. So they just include, they just put all the packages in there, which is kind of kind of senseless because what ends up that happening with the packages that makes your program run slower because it's like opening up the environment space. It's got to look in this area, then it's got to go look in this area, then it's got to go look in this area, and look in this area. And it's already found what it wanted, but you included all these extra packages, so it's going to look everywhere you want. So long story short, I only include the package that you are using. Classes can be grouped in collections. This collection concept is called the package. It actually is a, a made-up concept, actually. In the old days, there was some standard to it. It consisted of hierarchies, uh, such as the uh, Java language, Java utility. Those are in packages, actually. In fact, by default, java.lang <coughs> is included in the default environment for the JVM, or excuse me, for the, for the Java D D JDK. Utility, you actually have to add. When you do that, you have to import Java 
dot util asterisk, and I'll show you that in a few minutes as well. Um, you don't need to import classes that you create yourself, especially if they're in the same directory. If they're not in the same directory, then you've got to include a package. Package just tells you where it's located. It's almost like setting a path statement, you know, or a class path, actually, inside of the program. Main reason to use packages is to guarantee the uniqueness of class names. So, you're working with a third-party library, it's scanner drivers, and you're loading in a package, and you don't know if those, pa those names, you know, from that library match another library you have for a different manufacturer scanner. So, you import the package in and make sure that you have a unique, so packages are the same names, can be encapsulated in different packages. You can have different packages with the same name. And the uh, tradition of the package name is the reverse of the company's internet domain. <laughs> so we had com.hostname. That's not really used anymore, actually. Uh, now people come up with all sorts of different names. In fact, now they use the directory structure where they're actually putting the files. It doesn't have to match, it actually can be anything. It's just showing you, from a Unix perspective, it's showing you the resolution, where to find stuff. You put names in. What you do is you just create the package, right? And you add stuff to the package. Every time you <laughs> include package, you're including the file into the package. So it's kind of, that's why I say it's not really has anything to do with the physical location. It's more, but now it does because people actually use it as the physical <laughs> location. But it's more of a resolution of scope, if anything. Environment, so it's the environment for the program, or scope. So you're just setting the scope consistent. So. Here's an example um, of how it comes in handy in modern day use. This is what it's really used for these days. Um, let's say class importation. Two ways to access the public classes of another package. And going back to public, private, protected, packages only look at public if it's public within the package. If it's not in the package, you won't find it at all. If it's in the package, if it's private, it's not going to find it, which answers your question. You can't put anything private. It has to be public if you want to find it. You'd make it private if you had multiple versions and you wanted to select one or the other. So you made one private, you made one public, and you switched them or something. So, so explicitly give the full package name before the class name. Here's where we have java util.date. What we're really doing in our program when we import packages is we're going to import space, here it is, import space java.util.date. You're never going to really see that. You're going to see java.util.asterisk, meaning everything, give me everything from util package. Um, but here we just want to do date. And going back to the old C++ kind of thing, when you do import, it's kind of like includes. It only includes what's needed. So if you have extra stuff in there, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to make your program run any slower or anything like that. Uh, it, does, it does open up the search space, though. Um, so it might cause a conflict if you have two dates in there. Um, so here we have, um, if we're going to say, we're not going to import the package at all. And I'll show you the syntax for that in a sec. Or actually, it's right here. Um, we can actually say, before we type the word date as the data type, this object date, employee, boss, I could say, you know, Barbara dot something or other dot dot employee or something. Um, we're going to say from the util package take date as the object type, make a new variable, excuse me, a new instance of the object called today, which is going to be equal to new. And we also have to clarify here. We're going to run date java dot util dot date, the default constructor for date, um, which is a little different. Or we can just import use an import statement. This import happens at the top of the code. Oops and only the top of the code. You can't put it in the bit in the middle. It doesn't work. So it's kind of like the includes in the C++ days. Import happens on the top. And then we can say date dot today. Or we can just use the asterisk. And then we can say date today is equal to new date. And, uh, and just use date, which is what we've seen so far. This is how we're able to use system dot out, system dot in, um, because it's actually part of lang. But lang is included by default. In the old days, in fact, you'll still see source code examples that'll say, import java.lang. <laughs> it's like people do that just out of practice. In fact, if you have an old JVM, old, J old, excuse me, if you have an old JDK version, then you had to import it. The newer ones kind of just take it by default. So, so it's used to import classes um, at the current package level. It will not import classes at sub-packages. This is where people run into problems because they don't take everything in. It only goes back one level. It doesn't take sub-packages. 
Uh, so here's a sample. We have import Java X dot swing. This is the GUI output, GUI components that we're looking at. And we're going to do menu event C. We're going to create a new object called menu event C. And we're going to get an error message because uh, Java X dot swing dot event is what we needed. It's going to go this way. It's not going to go this way. <laughs> so the asterisk takes you the other, that doesn't take you to the sub levels. So you have to actually specify the level that you want to go and then work everything this way. It's included with that asterisk that's not this way. Because when you use that asterisk, like when you go like, you know, you know, F asterisk, it's like F1, F2, it gives you everything this way. It's exact opposite logic when you think about it. Uh, so the menu event is a package uh, in the event which is located in the dot swing, so the statement actually has to be resolved to the dot event star to take you everything for event. So hopefully that won't cause you too many nightmares. And then uh, you have the case in which you have a conflict. Let's say you have SQL and you have util and they both have date, which is what this example is all about. You're going to get an error message that's going to say, well, which date do you want? Actually, it's not going to be that nice. In fact, it's going to be some cryptic JVM message. That you're not going to make any sense to you when you look at it. Uh, but this is going to cause a problem because you have two dates. So in here, you need to go util sql util dot date, and that resolves it down to date. So that actually overwrites the util, or the S actually this will overwrite the sql because it'll include the date from util. Or you can specify it out here by going util dot date if you want to resolve it that way. It's kind of like what we do with um, files and directories. You know, we say, well, I want this file that's located in this directory. We put the C colon backslash, whatever. So if we specify where we're going with it, where we're going to find it, then we can resolve the conflict. Otherwise, we end up in a, sometimes we end up with a situation where there's a conflict, the same name within the same package, within multiple packages. And this is what I, is what I meant about multiple packages. It's going to look at everything. So the more packages you include, <laughs> the more name conflicts you might end up actually running into. And this happens all the time, actually, the SQL and the util, because date, time, um, even some of the string classes, actually, um, end up with a conflict sometimes, depending upon the names. Um, so you need to refer to both. You can use a full package name to resolve it. Here we have java.sql date, java.util.date. You might be thinking a date's a date. Not really. The format might be different. So. Depends on what you want to use. So, so now we have uh, java.math, lang.math, and we have uh, a class that we've got here. We've compiled it. We've got an error. Can't find the symbol method square root. Hmm. That's because we have to specify the class name and then the member name in this particular example. So for static members, you need to refer to them as the, this is the static member, the class name dot member name in order to resolve that. So this would be like math dot squirt, a square root, squirt, square root. <laughs> and uh, so static importation, uh, just a little note on that. It was part of uh, in the five version, I think we're up to six actually now. This is even old, but starting in five importation can also be applied to static fields and methods, not just classes. Uh, so you can directly refer to them as a static importation. It was not the case in previous versions. You actually had to import them. So import all the static methods and fields in the math class. If you go import static, see this is, oops, instead of saying import Java language, we didn't import any of the static ones. We just imported the public, the regular old instance variables. If we wanted to actually say specifically we actually had to say import static math lang and then use uh, double x for, let's say, equals pi. So import a specific field to go, you know, absolute value. So now we don't actually have to worry about previous Java versions. You had to, now it comes in automatically. So this is not really a problem. In fact, if you didn't get this, don't worry about it. It's not a problem for you anymore. <laughs> if you're working with old legacy code, you actually had to do something different to import the static information in. It didn't come in automatically. So the encapsulation of classes into a package, this is what we've been looking at is getting stuff out of a package. Now if we want to put it into a package, it's really easy. 
Actually, we add the class into the package in two steps. Put the name of the package at the top of the source code file. This is why I said it's kind of dangerous when you start putting a bunch of package names up there. It's not going to give you an error. In fact, you see it automatically by some of the IDEs. In fact, Eclipse will do it for you as well. Package this, package that. All these packages. Well, it just means you're putting it in all of these packages. Like, it's almost like you're doing the exact opposite of what you wanted because you're adding it to everything <laughs> instead of just what you're, how you're going to use it. So here we have a package, com, uh, host name, and then everything you put in here will be visible by everything else you put in here that's public. Or you can put the files in a package into a subdirectory which matches the full package name. And then you don't actually have to include it. This is how your core Java files are. Everything is by package. Well, when you include it, you actually have a lane, you actually have a util inside of the structure where all of the files that are associated with that package are stored. So you don't have to resolve it per file. So stored in the file employee.java, which is stored in under some path, com, host name, core Java, in terms of how it's stored. In fact, if you do that, you can do what we just saw in my examples, don't even include package in the file. If it's all stored in the same directory, it's in the same package, theoretically. So, to emphasize on data encapsulation, take a look here. We have uh, the class body, again, with the public, public, public. We have the constructor. We've seen this before. So problem, all of the fields are exposed and changes by everybody because everything is public. So this is the point I was making earlier. Make them private. So these are private. So by default, you know, you want to make the uh, data members private and then make them accessible, make them changeable, modifiable within the uh, method bodies. And so the problem, how can you access the fields? Well, through the methods. You have to add the behavior in there. So the next one here has you returning this, returning this, modifying this, modifying that, which is what you're doing in that first assignment, is you're making all of the data members private, and inside of the methods, you're actually inside of the class, you're creating methods to access to this, to modify this. So this is what they would consider good programming practice. So don't create any initialization code. Yeah, unless you want to, but make sure to put the method, use real methods for stuff. So now the fields ID, number, name, orbits are read only outside of the class, and then methods are that access the data are called accessor methods, which is where that word accessor methods and modifier methods come into play. We've got two sets so getting and setting information. So here's another piece, another modification with method setting fields. So this one's got, the, the other one I think had the accessors, this one has the modifiers in it, and the other part. And it's just terminology. You know, modifier's going to change the value of something, access is going to return the value. So modifiers always have void, you can see the void here. And if you use this, which I actually, the slide says doing get name, get orbits, set name, set orbit. So it's using the set get kind of terminology. In fact, you can kind of self-document the code yourself by doing that. You know, set name, set age, <laughs> get name, get age. And you can kind of look at that, oh, that's the accessor, that's the modifier. Nobody goes around calling it that. In fact, eh, you still see people saying get and set on methods. That's pretty common, actually. Because, you know, it makes sense. What are you doing with it? Uh, getting it, setting it. Uh, so note, uh, now users can set them through the, uh, but ID number is still read-only because it's private. So making fields private and adding methods to access them and enables you to uh, basically protect it in the future. So don't forget that private modifiers on the data fields when they're necessary, default value. What is this? The default access modifier for fields is package, actually, which means it's available throughout the package. So how is the virtual machine locating classes? Well, it's looking at the class path. So it's actually looking at the package that you're including. And then if you're working in, uh, and this is the interesting thing, is now you have distributed computing 101. You can put anything anywhere you want, really, as long as it's in the class path. Just like the same as the DOS path statement, class path just tells the JVM where to look for the .class files. 
So you can specify a couple of different directories, put all of the files in those directories. It'll go to the first directory. Did it find it? No. Go to the second one. Oh, I found it. Okay, good. Use it. So it resolves its own location. So programmer A can be working on his or her machine, save his or her files, programmer B. As long as it's all in the same class path, the whole program can be used together and people can share files, which gives you reusability, gives you distributed computing, gives you applications that can run across multiple different computers. And it's automatically built into the environment. So it's, it's not like a new programming technique. It's, built, it's a feature of the JVM that's facilitated by the class path, actually. So. And uh, setting the class path, there's a statement. In fact, in Windows, it's in the environment variables. If you go into the start menu, control panel system, on the bottom, you see environment variables. If you look at, um, I believe, the first series of tutorials, it'll run you through setting the environment variables for the path and for the class path. So, Actually, I don't think I set the class path in the, uh, in the tutorial uh, because I'm assuming you're running everything from the same environment. In fact, if you run it through Eclipse, it'll set the class path for you to the workspace directory. So, Naming conventions, and um, just some side notes is, uh, to recap some of this stuff. The package names always start with lower level, lower letters for some reason. Um, maybe it comes back from a Unix kind of thing. Everything's lowercase, lower levels. Class names always start with uppercase letters, so you can tell the difference between an object and a primitive, I think. I don't know. Probably some reason for that. Variables, fields, and methods names start with lower level letters. When you name your variables, you want to start with lower level. You can separate out. In fact, here's the multi-word technique when you capitalize the first character. That's pretty common in Java as well as on other languages like Hello with a capital W world app. And then the exception class names start with uppercase letters, end with exception. So out of memory exception, file not found exception. In fact, you can make up your own exceptions as well. Stupid programmer <laughs> found exception. <laughs> Supplemental reading, object-oriented programming concepts, these are actually pretty good links by Sun. The only problem with Sun's tutorials and Sun's information is that they're extremely long. Um, some of them are like volumes of information. In fact, you can go online and look at the class structure and the hierarchy. If you have enough patience and follow it from object all the way down to whatever it is you're working on, and everything's related to everybody else. There's a huge hierarchy, actually, the base classes that are associated with the language. The only problem is uh, it kind of reads like Greek, and there's a lot of documentation. And uh, they don't actually provide too much for uh, each one of the, uh, each, you know, it's such, it, it almost it just says a couple of lines, like, this class is used for math. Hmm. Okay, well, well, what is it? What's in there? You know, we're literally wanting to know he's looking for a method or something, you know, how do you do it with the absolute value? You're not going to find that, you're just going to find a hierarchy. And I'm not quite sure why, but outside of the fact that maybe there's just way too much information in there. Right. Unless you guys want to break, I'm going to continue forward because this is our last lecture. You know, I want to break. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Good deal. <laughs> last but not least for today, uh, extending classes. Uh, in fact, believe it or not, the base class and inheritance and the polymorphic concept are the main core concepts of object orientation. And I'm giving you kind of a lot, and so what I want to do is kind of go through inheritance, and I want to show you the second assignment. Because after this, you know, new people are going to have to get the data in the book. But I, <laughs> the experienced people after this, they probably know what to do for the second assignment as well. So you can probably knock out both of them before the next class meeting in March. So, Concept of uh, inheritance is actually kind of easy. In fact, I have an example I'll show you out in Windows that kind of works with the concept. So you can create new classes that are built upon existing classes. And the, there's one word, extends. As long as you can remember that word, it's the same as building a class. Uh, but you have to work, you have to kind of think about the properties and the behavior that's associated with that. So through the way of inheritance, you can reuse existing classes and methods and without reinventing the wheel. The fields, the methods, everything gets inherited. And it also adds new methods, and you can adapt and change. We have subclass and superclass, as I mentioned before. Super is everything above, sub is everything below, but it's the opposite way. So a base class is a super, an inherited class is a sub. So you create a subclass, a subclass. And so 
you're gonna, it's backwards. The terminology is backwards than the logical thinking of it. At least it is for me. So subclass and superclass have an is-a relationship. Everything in a sub is, is a part of the main base. And is a, everything is a part of everything else. So an object of a subclass is an object of the superclass. Super. Actually, you can remember super's above, sub's below. Sub and super. Here we go. We have superclass and subclass. And uh, the superclass is person. And uh, public class person. It has to be public in order to make a, an extended class on it. If it's private, we can't see it. So we can only use inheritance with public. Or Pri or protected, but we'll talk about protected later. In fact, I won't even hit protected today. Public class student, here's the key word here, extends person. So every student is also a person in this particular example. So in here we have a private string name, and uh, that's part of person. And then we have private integer student number, Students have student IDs, but people don't necessarily have student IDs unless they're students. In the uh, superclass, just to reiterate a few points, we have a constructor here. Default constructor doesn't take on any parameters. It's the same name as a class person. And then we have one that takes on a name. So we can set a name one that gets, gets the name. So set a name, get a name, set a name here, get a name. Basic functionality. And then over here in the uh, subclass, we have a student number. Notice we don't have the name repeated. We just have the number. And here we have no methods that say person on them at all. We have methods that just say student. Because every person, oh, excuse me, every person is also, excuse me, every student is also a person. So when we extend the class from a class, we get two classes in one. We get students that are people. So we can automatically use this name as if, because it's also part of us. So as a student, we're also a person. So we use both. Common, 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 common error, and I see it all the time, is people take and they'll put private string name over here. Private string name, private string, student number. They end up rewriting the class. And it works, and then the compiler doesn't give them an error. And it, but you really haven't inherited anything. You've just rewritten the class. You, you know, you can probably just take out extends person and have a student class that does all that stuff. There's no need to actually create two classes out of this. In this particular example, you could put it all into one. I mean, theoretically. But this is a small example. If you have a bigger one, you don't want to go through and reinvent the wheel in your extended class. Okay, so here we have student. And we have... Again, two more, and then here we have a get student number, get student name. When we run get student number, it's running get student number. It's not going to run get name. The method that we're running is going to be the method depending upon where it's located. If we create an object person, we can still run get name. We can still run set name from our person object because imagine we just have two and one. And Java as a language has a single line inheritance. No multiple line. This is where you get differences between different object-oriented languages. In fact, C++ is the same thing. It's a single line inheritance. One object can only inherit from one other. So if you were just remember this extends up here, you can only put one. <laughs> extends this, extends that. And so here's your single line, actually object, person, student. And you see the arrows going back up, everything comes out of object. So everything in the core language is inherited from object. So every class is an extension or inherited class, whether or not it's declared to be or not, actually, because it's all coming from object. So the class doesn't declare explicitly, extend another class, and then implicitly comes from, or implicitly extends the object class in terms of the hierarchy. So even if you create Hello World, you're using inheritance, <laughs> theoretically is you're inheriting from objects in terms of what you're doing. Um, yeah, other languages, um, Smalltalk has multiple inheritance, actually, another object-oriented language, um, in which you can extend from this class to that class. Then you can actually, be, it's actually more powerful, but it's more complicated. What makes Java easy is it kind of follows the C++, which is single-line inheritance. So instead of taking this class and this class, and now we're in this class, 
this class, this class, multiple line inheritance, all into this class, it gets confusing, actually. Uh, if you go this line, this line, and we're not talking just this line, because this one class can have this way, this way, this way, this way. And then this one can have this way, this way, this way. It's just there's a single path that you can traverse through the tree, yeah? I don't think it does. Kaz, does it have multiple line inheritance? It's been a while. I, I could be wrong. Can you inherit from more than one class? Oh no, you can you can inherit multiple through the line, but can you inherit one from one level multiple classes? Extends this, implements that, extends this. Um, I'll look it up for you, or you can look it up on your own. It's not a really big deal, because we're not comparing, I mean, for purposes of this class. Advantage of, uh, not advantage, but... In we, have ex in, we have extends and implements, in which Java. is different. In Java. In Java, yeah. But in C++, extends... Extends... Several Actually, I don't think we use extends. It's just colon, I guess. It's colon. Yeah. But it's colon with one class, I believe. Yeah, how many people think we have multiple? Raise your hand. You? Multiple? I, I just have... Okay. Well, I, I, you, I could be... Just semester. Oh, okay, okay. Um, then you, I stand Maybe corrected. It's already like four, uh, I can tell you for sure Java is only single line. <laughs> Whether or not C or play. I, you know, I, I, it's been a while. So, I mean, I, I could be wrong with that. So, it's no problem. So, yeah. Um, when you end up with multiple line, I think in the long run, it becomes a little bit more confusing to follow yes. it. Um, which is kind of what makes Java a little bit more simplified in terms of what it does. We can uh, extend, which is inheritance, but we can also implement, which is different in Java, which gives us sort of like multiple line inheritance in other languages, but it's used for different purposes. I'm actually not going to cover the implement because I'm not going to cover interfaces. This term, I mean this particular class, that's part of the next, that's what's coming up in the future. But. Uh, for new people, it's going to be way too overwhelming. <laughs> so let's talk about inheritance. Um, when we extend, we build one class from another. So the object of an extended class contains two sets of variables and methods. It contains the current set, and it contains the set from the inherited class. So we can define locally in the extended class new added on field. So what we're doing essentially is what they call it a specialization to move ahead. In fact, there's some languages that have classes that you call specialized. <laughs> we don't have that in Java, thank God, because that would be way too confusing. But what we're doing with inheritance is we're specializing. So every person is a, excuse me, every student is a specialized version of a person. So it contains all of the person, and then it contains things that are specific to people. So we can take person and turn it into teacher, person into student, person into, which is, Kind of like where I was going with the, with, the, with the line. And we can trace through Java. We can trace back from here to here to here and here. And we end up with a single line path through the tree. And uh, now I'm kind of curious. I have to go look it up for C++. I'll take your word for it, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you might be right. You separate them by commas. Mm -hmm. Is that how you do it? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's too late Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I, you know in the back of my mind, it's kind of sparking a memory. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, but because I remember we had to, well, Java is kind of funny because they can map it out. Like when you go online and you look at the Java doc stuff, you can kind of see, you can click on here and it opens up here and there's a direct path that leads to point A to point B. And it's not really the same in every language. It's a little different. So now I'm kind of curious. I'll have to look it up. All right. So, uh, to move, on, to move on here, what are the fields of a student object in the previous example? Well, the student object in the previous examples, we've seen the fields, which are the data members, are going to be two. The student number, that was part of student, but also the name, that's part of person, because every student is a person, um, to answer that question. So now we, we will revisit this and super. <laughs> so we know what this is, hopefully. Does C++ have this? Because have this? you yes. said you recently took it. It does have it. Does it, it has super, too. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's what I thought. Does it have um, the direct call, or do you have to put this dot something? I think if it's a pointer, um, the arrow, 
Ah, no, yeah, I know about that. Yeah, for if it's a the dot resolution for um, pointers turns into an arrowhead and uh, versus the dot. <laughs> yeah, but that's actually a slightly different concept. That's the resolution. They have scope resolution. You're right. There is multiple line inheritance because that's why scope resolution exists. <laughs> you have to go within. Ah, yeah, when you build the interface, when you build the implementation off of the class in interface in C++, you have to do scope resolution. The two colons together looks like a square mm -hmm. to say this method inside of this class because it supports multiple inheritance. You're right. <laughs> I knew it. We don't have that in Java. There's no scope resolution because there's only one class it could possibly come from, which is itself. Uh, because everything is included automatically through the scope rules. So we don't actually have scope either. We don't have to worry about resolving methods. If we want to overwrite a method, we just use the same name <laughs> and we overwrite it. If we don't overwrite it, we just use the same name with a different set of parameters. Kind of like what we saw with the constructors. We can overload, which is using the same name as a method that already existed from a previous class in the structure. Use the same name, but call it with a different set of parameters. Supports polymorphism by default and allows us to overload the functionality. If we overwrite it, we use the same number of parameters, the same name, and it takes a look through the hierarchy and it uses whatever it finds first and says, well, this is the most current. You overwrite it. This is what we're going to do with it, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then not to move totally ahead, but all of the constructors fire. <laughs> Every single one of them is going to fire off for you. <laughs> Which is why people, going back to your comment about constructors, is why people like to use initialization sometimes. You have initialization code, it will actually trigger, but it won't have the same behavior as the constructor. A st constructor you can override, or you can overload. You can't overload or override initialization code that you put into the class body. It doesn't work the same way. It's not used in inheritance. so. All right, let's talk about super for a second. Super is used just like this, but it's super. It's the same concept, but you're talking about your inherited cl your, the class you inherited from, the one above you, or the base, actually, if you want to turn it around. So the constructor of the extended class can invoke one of the super class's constructors by using super. Same thing as we saw before. So if no, uh, no super class constructor is invoked explicitly, then the super's no argument constructor is invoked. Same example we saw with this. Uh, so it's invoked automatically. So the constructors are not methods and are not inherited. So the constructors can be overwritten and, and overloaded, but they're not actually methods, so they're not inherited, which means you can't run them. So you have to use the super, or you have to use this in order to get those constructors to fire when you want them. And you're lucky. There's other sadistic teachers that make you play around with this behavior in terms of assignments, I don't have you do that. <laughs> I thought about it and I went, no, it's okay. Make it so that design three classes that all inherit it from each other and give me this functionality for the constructors to go off. It's like one of the trickiest things to kind of figure out because it's like playing a game. You actually almost have to outline it okay, this one's going to trigger first, this one's going to trigger second. Oh, if I put super in here, I'm going to cause this one to trigger first. And then you can switch the order around. And there's a sadistic assignment you can actually do where it prints out numbers to the screen. You don't need to get the numbers one, two, three, four, five. But the order in which you have to implement it is different. <laughs> so you have to switch around. It's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a mad game. It's not good. All right, so three phases of object construction. And the object has created memories allocated for the fields. We know that part already, which are initially set for the default values. We know that part already. And then it's followed by the three phase construction. All right, so you invoke the super classes constructor. So now we have to turn things around backwards again. It starts with the base and works to the specialized class. So the super classes constructors, so now we're running super class. Every superclass has a superclass, has a superclass, has a superclass. Everybody's a superclass and a subclass. <laughs> superclass has a subclass. Subclass is a superclass for the subclass. Superclass for the subclass. So you have to follow all the line. You go back. The superclass of everybody is first, second, third, fourth through the lines. 
initializing the fields by using their initializers and their initializing blocks come next. So the initialization comes next after the constructors. And then the execute body of the constructor. So invoke a constructor's constructor is executed using the same three constructors. It's the same thing, same, same configuration. So the process is executed recursively until you get to the object. So you can go back to the object and we'll work forward. I think I have an example. Here it is. <laughs> Um, so let's see. To illustrate the constructor order, we have class X and we have class Y that extends X. And uh, you're lucky you don't actually have to do this. You don't have to simulate this. Uh, we have uh, <coughs> an integer X order equals 1. Y order is equal to 2. We have a constructor here that says which order is going to be equal to Y order which order is over here, it's a variable in class X and you can follow the logic along here, this constructor is going to set the X order to equal to which order so we have the base and we have the inherited extended class both setting the value of which order so none of the fields, everything zero Y constructor invoked zero, 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 X oops, Y, Y, Y why? <laughs> Starting basically going back to ground zero and then going forward to all of the extended from the super. So. Um, you can come up with your own chart and graph and things, but just make uh, note all of the constructors fire and the supers always go first. And then you can map it out and say, this one's first, that one's second. And uh, usually you see that in a lot of like you know, for, I was going to say, it's for sadistic teachers that want you to map it all out. Um, in real life, people like, you know, if you're setting a constructor to initialize the variables of that particular class, that particular object, then it's great. It will initialize everything. And if you keep everything separated out logic-wise per class, you'll never run into a problem because a person always has to be a person. A person's going to have a name, right? So... If the person's already a person, then when you turn it into a student, you're just adding the student number to the name. And if you're building on the implementation and you're specializing it, it doesn't matter. All the stuff has to go off anyway. You're not going to get duplicate. When you run into problems is when you start changing and overriding the behavior. And then all of a sudden, you don't want that one to go change something that you already changed here or vice versa. And then what ends up happening is you run into a weird situation when you run it and you go, what is it equal to five? <laughs> That's when you have to go back and kind of look at your constructors. And at that case, most people just start removing out of the base, which is kind of weird. So a lot of people fix problems by getting rid of the inheritance altogether. They go back and they start chopping at the base class. Remove this, remove this, remove this. Oh, we'll just put it right on right here. And then you're not really using inheritance. <laughs> you fix the problem by not using inheritance, essentially. And uh, if you're trying to build a huge structure out of this, you're not, you're not taking advantage of object-oriented programming techniques. You're cutting, cutting, edge, cutting, cutting it short, short-changing yourself. I guess the word I'm needing. So overriding and overloading is what you need to do. So that's why people like to make things protected. Um, if it's protected, it can be changed in a subclass. If it's private, it can't be touched at all. If it's public, you're not protecting it. You're opening it up to the public. If the methods are all public, great. If you're, if you're intending for it to be used in the driver program, you start working with inheritance and you start working with protection. Protected class this, protected this, protected this, because you're building a class that you know is going to be built on in the future. As an example, if you start out with shape, you don't want shape to change. Shape is going to have, it's going to define um, how many walls or, I want to say car as a model. You create a protected class car, and then you can create cars that are have sunroofs, cars that are convertible, cars that have two wheels instead of three wheels, hybrid cars, you know, all different. But if you one of these classes out here goes back in and changes car, <laughs> it messes it up for everybody else. So what ends up happening is all the base classes are set in stone. You don't want anyone to go touch that. And you leave that alone. 
Otherwise, it's like building a house on a bad foundation. Eventually, the whole system is going to collapse. And you're going to end it with nothing. Your whole house is going to fall down if you start messing with the base. So overloading and overwriting is how you're supposed to work with those extended classes. And so overloading provides more than one method with the same name but different parameter lists. That's what I meant when I said complementing. You're adding to the list of methods. And you're doing this with more than just constructors. So far we've seen overloading of constructors. Well, they have the same name, different set of parameters. Now we can have the same method, same concept with different set of parameters. Gives us polymorphism by default. Where there's other concepts that I'm going to talk about next time that deal with polymorphic behavior. But this is just one small example of it. Um, overwriting replaces the superclasses implementation with a method of its own design. You override when you really want to specialize. When you're not changing the base, but for this particular car, you want to, it's not a gas car anymore. It's now a water car. It runs on water or something. Well, what does it run on now? nowadays? A battery power. <laughs> battery car. So you can override it, take out gasoline completely and exchange everything with battery, but it doesn't affect any of the other gasoline cars out there. They're still using the same method. And you're not touching the base, you're leaving the gasoline functionality there. So you use overriding and overloading to change the behavior. This is the theme that you're getting with the next assignment, assignment number two. And when I got when I get done with this lecture, which is not that much left actually, I'll have an example to show you inheritance, and then I'll go over assignment number two for you briefly so you can have something to work on in the meantime. Accessibility and overwriting. So a method can be overwritten only if it's accessible to the subclass. This is what I said about private, protected, public. So protected on the bottom here always will be protected, public. Um, not as simple as it seems in terms of what happens because then you end up with problems when something is private and you can't work with it. And the other thing, too, is like this is kind of like the bad thing of going back and modifying a class that's already been written. You don't want to change the access methods either. <laughs> you sort of want to work with what's there because it was hopefully there for a reason. So private methods in a sub superclass can't be overwritten. So if the superclass contains a method for which the same signature as the one in the subclass, these methods are totally unrelated, which means if you can't overwrite it, then you can create a new one. You're not overwriting. You're actually, if it's private and you create it in the subclass, it's brand new. So then that so ends up with a source of confusion because you have this method and you have this method. One's private. <laughs> it's like, it's not overridden. So that's not going to fire. That's not going to work. This one's going to be brand new. So it's not really overriding. It's brand new. Packages, methods in the sub super class can be overridden in the subclass if the same package, if it's in the same package as the subclass, because it's going to override it with something new. And it, from a package level, can also work. And then protected and public methods are always will be protected, and they will always be public, which means they can be changed or they can be used. And again, I know it's as simple as it looks, but it's it's not hard. And uh, I don't like this example, so I'm going to skip it. It's extremely confusing. <laughs> it's slide number 11. If you want to download it from lecture 4, I skipped it for the day class, too, for the weekday class, because it's just not, it's not a happy example. In fact, it causes more confusion than anything. So, Hiding fields. <laughs> fields cannot be overridden. They can only be hidden, essentially. So the field name is declared in the subclass and it has the same name as the one in the superclass and the field belongs to the subclass cannot be accessed directly by its name anymore. It's hidden. So it's really not overriding. It's still there. It's just like, in fact, this is a, the text I gave you for the previous example I gave you about over, not overriding, but just replacing. So. And uh, believe it or not, I actually talked about polymorphism already and already created it for you. And you kind of have seen, hopefully you've seen through the process of how these methods work and how overriding and complementing or overloading kind of can create it. So that's just one example. There's more examples of it in throughout the language. So an object that's given uh, 
An object of a given class can have multiple forms, either as a declared class type or as any of the other subtypes. So actually, we can create polymorphism through the class extending as well. We can turn objects into other objects. We can morph them into anything we want. We can do that by extending out the behavior and specializing. Um, so an object is extended class can be used whenever the original class is used. Because if everybody's a part of everybody, then the ancestry is the direct line is established and you can actually kind of go back and forth and morph through. A student can be a person and vice versa, which is another form of polymorphism, as we've seen. Uh, do we want to do the question? Given the fact that an object's actual class type may be different from its declared type, then when a method accesses an object member, which gets redefined in the subclass, then which member of the method refers to the subclass or the superclass? Hmm. Depends on which one you call. So when you invoke the method through the object reference, when you're, object, when you're referencing the object directly, the actual class of the object decides which one, which implementation is going to be used, depending upon what you've done in terms of overriding or overloading. So it's going to make its own determination dynamically. So. All right. And... Uh, what do we got here? Oh, do I want, oh, I don't want to do this one either. But this is showing you two show methods of uh, a super show and uh, extended show from super show. <laughs> and when you run it, it's going to invoke different ones depending upon the logic of which one it finds from which instance you're created, well, from which object you're running. So it's another one of those confusing examples that uh, you don't want. If you, want to, if you want to go through it, you can actually look at it, but it is pretty straightforward, I guess. And um, I have some miscellaneous concepts at the end of this particular lecture. We've actually hit inheritance completely. In fact, that is, believe it or not, all there is to know about inheritance. You follow the same rules. You just create more classes and follow more classes. It gets kind of tricky when you start developing more complex applications, and I'll go through some of that in the next, next class about that. So. We're looking at a strongly typed language. <laughs> an apple is an apple, an orange is an orange. You can't mix and match types, which means you have to do a lot of conversion, and we've seen it already, parsing to an integer, parsing to float. We can also explicitly call objects, and we can test to see if an object is of a particular type, and is it a particular type within the object structure, because looking at all this inheritance in the family tree, we have different object types. Every one of them is a different type. Um, so we can compare between different objects, um, so in terms of compatibility, when you assign a value to an expression to a variable, type of the expression might be compatible or declared type of the variable. Um, might be a type, might be a subtype of the declared type. So we can test. And, uh, oops, where's my test? I'm going to skip ahead and then come backwards. Where's my object test? Oh, I guess it wasn't here. Hmm, I guess I missed it. Well, we can do an object of um, type which is basically a method called on the object to get its type and test it with another type of object to see if it's compatible in terms of what type it is. Types of higher, it's the same thing you get in C or C++ when you do typecasting. In fact, this is typecasting done in object-oriented Java, where we can take a big number, excuse me, we can take a small number and put it into a big space, but we can't take a big number and put it into a small space because we're going to run out of room. <laughs> which is when you start moving around, that's the only thing is widening and shortening is the terminology that they use. So types of higher up in the hierarchy, believe it or not, they actually in the hierarchy of the types determines the space. So you can go down, but you can't go up in the level in terms of the object. So it's said to be wider, less specific, the higher you go up. And so the more you go down, the more specialized you get. So the more space it takes up because the more stuff you need to add to it. It's kind of like trying to take a student and pushing it into a person's space. The person doesn't have as much information as the student. So if you translate it back and you change the object, the whole person's not going to fit in the space that's reserved. Excuse me, the whole student isn't going to fit in the space that was originally reserved for the person object. Because one's a specialization, has more stuff added to it. Although they're both the same, we end up with this phenomenon that occurs. So lower types are said to be narrower, higher types are wider. Widening conversion assigns a subtype to a supertype. 
the sub can go to super for widening. Can be checked at compile time, no action is needed. Narrowing, converting a reference of a super type into a reference of a subtype. Taking the super, which is the student, turning it into a person is what's going to cause you the problem. So that actually has to be converted using a typecasting operator. The other way around is easier, actually, because you don't have to make any extra space. But if you take a person, excuse me, take a student and turn them into a person, then we have to make more room. No, other way around. Take a student and turn them into a person, then we have to make more room because we have to widen the space. I can confuse myself with this all day. <laughs> all right, so let's just take a look here at the two kinds of type conversions. This is kind of summarizes the, the widening assigns a subtype to a supertype. And the narrowing converts a reference of the supertype and into a reference of the subtype. So it takes from a super to a sub or sub to a super. Okay. Here we go. We can take object here. And this is typecasting. Essentially, it's the same thing. In fact, it's the same format I think you can see or C++. We can take integer inside or float inside the brackets here and typecast one object to another. I believe it's the same format, but don't quote me on that. So explicit typecasting, the type name within parentheses before the expression. So for widening, not necessary, and it's a safe cast. To take here, we have string, string object that holds test. And we've got, actually, we've got object object one, object two, and we're going to type object from string. So it's, it's safe. For narrowing cast, and uh, it provides, but it's unsafe because we don't know. We might have some precision. It's the same thing. Actually, it's the same problem you get in C or C++ when you type typecasting. Precision might change. Rounding or truncating of characters or something of that nature. So narrowing must provide um, must be provided. Here we have double to string. So double numbers, a double object. Well, object was created as string, so we're changing an object string into a double. We might have a little problem with it. And uh, long story short, they used to tell you in C or C++ don't typecast <laughs> because you didn't know what you were converting to what. With Java, there's actually typecasting built into the design because you can't, and this example kind of demonstrates it, you can't compare apples and oranges, so you actually have to, in order to do a comparison with one object to another, you actually have to cast it. But when you convert it, it's supposed to be safer because the runtime environment is supposed to be managing this for you. In the old days of the compile time, C++, when you ran the program, it reserved the memory ahead of time. So much space was reserved, and it was statically allocated at runtime. Here it's dynamic, so it can change as you act. And when you typecast here, you're supposed to be changing the variable size, the space needed, theoretically. So, and here's an example of some of the errors you might come into. An example is a student is a subclass of person, going back to that example. <coughs> if we do test here, we have the wrong. We're trying to mix and match a student with a person. We're taking a student object, we're trying to assign it to an array element that belongs to a student, or vice versa. So. You can go ahead and lo basically go through the logic. If you're brand new to this, don't worry about this. <laughs> if you're an experienced Java person, you probably have run into this already. You've had a, a case in which you've had to turn a person into a student or vice versa. And even though a student is a person, you have to do a, a cast to it to treat it like a person. Otherwise, you're not going to get apples and apples together for a comparison. And here's what I was looking for, actually. Instance <coughs> of... So they have a built-in feature in the language to actually see what your object is an instance of <laughs> so that you can properly assign it the right roles so that you can do a proper comparison with it. So type testing. So you can test the object's actual class by using the instance of operator here. So if object is an instance of string, then treat it like a string or <coughs> convert it or do something with it. So. And then here we have the abstract classes and methods. And I believe this is the last content of this, of this uh, lecture. We're going to winding down a little bit. Um, abstract classes. If you have abstract methods, you have to have an abstract class. So if you have more than, if you have at least one or method inside, um, and an abstract method is one that does not have an implementation. 
so you're building a base class. You know you're going to want something to set the name, but you don't want to write the code for it. So you take and you create the method as abstract and leave it empty. So it's empty. But the person who's going to write the superclass that's going to build on this is going to fill in the blanks for you. It's kind of like doing the exact opposite instead of having the person overwrite or overload. It's just going to leave a blank because you know it's not going to be implemented. If you do that, you have to mark the class as abstract. And now you have abstract. Now you know how to use that, hopefully, in terms of it. You don't need abstract unless you're, unless you're going to do the implementation. You don't need abstract. So I see it all the time. Abstract class such and such. <laughs> and then when you build the class on it, when you extend it, it gives you an error message. Well, you have to implement this method. And so then you see a fully implemented class that everything's marked abstract. And you see an extended class where everything is just the body is rewritten and it's overwritten. So you have two implementations of the same classes going on for no apparent reason. And then I wonder, why are these people using the word out? And then people think, oh, let's strip out the word abstract. Right? And then they start, and then they realize, oh, it's being overridden. So then we can take this out. And all of a sudden, they have nothing over here. And then they end up with one class. <laughs> because this guy really didn't have anything involved at all in it. So you see this with library files all the time, when you're supposed to write the code for something. But it's specific to your application. So you mark it abstract in the base so that it can be implemented. This is kind of like the .h and the .c file in C++, but we don't have that. We don't have an implementation and a specification. So in, in uh, C++, we, the .h's are the specification, the .c++'s are the implementation. We don't have that. Instead, we have abstract, which is the same concept. If you mark it abstract, that means it's a it's 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 basically a specific it's it's a um, bleh. it's a template it's what you want the person to actually implement it's specified but it's not implemented yet so you're waiting so because you don't want to reinvent the wheel anyway so you're trying to cut down on a number of words so let's see abstract classes some methods are only declared but not concrete implementations are provided so they need to be implemented by extended classes if they're not implemented the compiler will give them an error and it'll say, come back and say, hey, you need to implement this class. And that class is not implemented. This class is not implemented. This is when you see those funny things, those, you know, re, everyone putting in classes everywhere, or methods everywhere because they keep getting an error and they're doing it to satisfy the compiler, but they really don't know what they're doing. So each method that has no implementation is in the abstract class must be declared as abstract if you're not implementing it. No rule that says you actually have to, though. If you don't put the word abstract there, then there's no requirement for you to implement it. The word abstract just tells the compiler, if you're extending on this class, you have to implement it. <laughs> so people get around the air by taking the word abstract off, and then that fixes their problem. <laughs> but it, it destroys the integrity of the system that was originally built. If you're extending an abstract class, you have two situations. Leave some uh, or all of the abstract methods methods will be undefined, then the uh, subclass must be declared as abstract as well, or define concrete implementations for the inherited abstract methods, so the subclass is no longer abstract, so you can define, or you can just leave it alone and put abstract on it, two methods. So an object of an abstract class cannot be created. You can't create objects of abstract classes, that's another problem people run into, because there's nothing in the class. It's kind of like a template. But it's not like a template here in C++. It's kind of a different concept. It's just you can't, there's no, there's no functionality in it. So note that declaring the object variables of an abstract class is still allowed, uh, but such variables can only be referenced to the object of the non-abstract class that's created from the abstract class. Protected, I actually talked about this already. Protected is private to the main driver program but public to any class that wants to subclass. So it's allowed subclass methods to access superclass fields defined as protected. So, be, but be cautious because then you can actually override behavior. If you're gonna make something private, make it private. <laughs> if you're using protected so that you can violate the rules, then you've essentially made everything public with protected because all of your extended classes can pretty much do whatever they want. So you're not really protecting the class at all. 
Um, you have to trust you're going to use the method correctly. What protected really means precisely accessing within the class itself and uh, within itself, within inside of the code in the same package. So a superclass can essentially access it if it were public. I believe this is the last. I should be getting down to the bottom here. Uh, let's see. How much more of this do I have? No. Oops. I uh, had two slides left. I think the temperature is good in here. Are you turning it on? We're actually winding down soon here, too. Oops. Oh, well. What did I do? Okay. Technology difficulties. Hold on. Yeah, let's see what was on that last slide. Now yeah, let's skip that because I'm kind of burnt out on it. <laughs> I'm sure you guys don't mind. In fact, I'll show you the example instead. It'll make more sense to you. Meanwhile, my Windows partition has fallen asleep. Uh, let's see. All right, not yet out on the website, but I'm putting it out, is a example I call inheritance. And the inheritance example works with, um, well, I got a couple here. I have inheritance number one that has a base class, so it's class my base. It's all in one file, believe it or not. And uh, it's using this.x, x. In fact, I'm not calling any of the constructors explicitly using this. In fact, instead, I'm just referring to the variables. My base, and then we have my derived, which extends my base here. Hopefully, you can see that. Oh, you can actually see that. And now we're adding y to it. So my base has got x. It's kind of like the example that was in the PowerPoint slide. The derived class has got y in it. And then we've got uh, public my derived x, which is sending in an x. And then I'm running super x. Because from the y, I want to I wanna actually send x back up here, and I want to initialize x with x. So I'm getting, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm running up here my base to set x from y, or excuse me, from my derived class, my derived that extends my base. So it's an example essentially of what the other example did with this but it's using super to say come back up and run from the base class, the constructor, to set x. So y, y, my derived, is using everything from x and not overriding it and complementing it and adding y to it in the derived class. And um, the rest of it is kind of trivial. It's just, uh, here's the driver program. It's all in one file, um, which is kind of bad practice, but it's just made as a simple example. And this is just basically creating an instance of uh, base and my derived and showing you that x and y exist. And x only exists in the base and y exists in the specialized version, you know, my derived. I don't have that out actually on the website yet, but I'm going to put it out. I was showing this example essentially to the last class that happened last week, so it hasn't been updated. It's, it's bringing us current um, and here we have the other interesting thing here, is we have purple and we have violet. And uh, purple is the base class, so it's kind of working with a color theme. And uh, purple uh, prints out purple running, and i is equal to i, i is equal to zero, and this is a variable. And then we have uh, another constructor that sets i for us, so this dot i is equal to i, and then purple running i is equal to something. And then we have violet, which extends purple. And I've purposely kind of left out, um, but here I've, I've just said violet. I've left out all my public and everything. <laughs> I've, left, I've left out a lot of information just to simplify the example. And uh, when you run violet, it's going to say violet running I. Excuse me, this, this particular um, constructor is for violet. And we have the other constructor that's going to run and take in a value, just the same way as we had purple. Um, and then out here we're going to have uh, two of them, and we're going to see that both purple and 
violate, in fact, I'm going to run this actually so you can kind of sort of see what I'm talking about. And this demonstrates that multiple constructors, in fact, all of the constructors are going off because, um, hold on a second. I'll just compile everything in here. I think this one was called inheritance too. Oops. No, we don't have inheritance too. What was this called? Hold on a second. Let me just see what's going on here. In here. It's two. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, what are we looking at? In the inheritance two example, the inheritance one is kind of trivial actually. We've seen we've seen most of the functionality in the slide set. In this one here, what we're looking at is the name of the uh, object being printed out with the i value, so i0, zero, i0, zero, i0, zero, and it's kind of showing you how the constructors are firing off, and um, shows you that a purple, that violet actually does a purple. It starts out and prints out the purple, the violet, the purple, the violet, and we haven't made any purple instances. We're just working with violet. We're running two violets. We've created, and this is here to put it on purpose to show you how sloppy you can be. I didn't actually, I created two instances by saying new, so I said new violet and new violet four, but I didn't assign them to the value of any variable. Normally I would say violet space my violet equals new violet. I would take this. This is actually the code that's creating the instance. And I did just to kind of show you again another kind of functionality thing where you don't have to follow this format that I've been doing. In fact, you'll see this when you start seeing temporary objects that are created for exchanging types or for doing certain things, for running certain code, um, where it won't be assigned to a value of an object variable. It'll just be executed on the fly. And um, anyway, the example is basically creating two instances of the violet object, but it's demonstrating that the purple, I mean, like, where's the purple coming from? It's coming out of the base class, and the constructors weren't overridden. They were still firing off. So, um, I'll put that out on the website so you can actually kind of download it and take a look at it in a lot more detail and kind of see what's going on with it. Um, let's see, one second. I had another uh, person payroll. I didn't actually go over that example with the day class, with the weekday class. Um, so I think I'll save that one for next time because I need to revisit the uh, inheritance concept before we start talking about other things next time. So it's kind of a good segue to overlap this session with the next session. But I want to take a, a couple of seconds here and actually kind of look at um, the next assignment, just in case you're interested in doing it. It is assignment number two. And uh, just in case you haven't found where they're located, they are in the weekday class section. Although we have a weekend class here, we don't have anything in here. All we're going to have are uh, discussion discussion boards and a section where you can actually post comments to the TA. So if you go into object-oriented design, we see we have general class discussions and we have teacher assistant forum. We don't have any materials here um, because this is the same section or same course as being taught in the weekday format. And so in the weekday format, up here is where you're going to find the materials for the course. I did have a student ask, which is why I'm bringing this to your attention. And uh, you'll see the syllabus, you'll see the course materials, if you click on the course materials link. You'll see, the first thing you'll see are all the assignments. There's only five of them total. It looks like a lot more because of all the sample files. And uh, you'll see also videotape recordings, or video, not tape, <laughs> they're just electronic recordings of the classes from the weekday. I'm going to hopefully try and label them. It's like this one says inheritance and polymorphism. This is actually the last one that they had. But because they have a holiday on Monday, they're not going to actually, you're not going to see one until the following week because this class actually happens on Monday. And you see down here where it says PowerPoint. These are the PowerPoints I've been going through. So I've gone through lecture four already, which means next time I'll do five, six, seven, eight, nine ish. I'll, I'll probably hit most of them because the following session we have the final exam. 
So again, I'll probably kind of cover, you know, a good percentage of them next time. And I'll leave to, toward the ends, it actually kind of gets easier. Once we get over kind of the hurdle, of some of the basic concepts, it becomes a lot easier. In fact, uh, you'll see over here where it says lecture examples, shape, point, circle. These are all executable code uh, that you can download. We haven't gotten to lecture five yet, so we don't have to worry about the test and the output yet. But uh, I'm going to actually upload some more inheritance stuff that I'll put in here and I'll label it like lecture slash three slash inheritance example and stuff like that. So you can kind of see. I haven't put those up there yet. Um, so assignment number two, if you click on the link, it actually takes you to a spot where you can download the file. I'm going to save it to the desktop. It's all in Word files, and again, you can get the materials here no problem. The only thing is you can't um, you can't upload the assignments here. You have to you have to upload them into the ITU database. So I just downloaded here um, Java programming assignment number two, and uh, just to give you kind of a preview, so you can decide whether or not you want to do it. It's not a bad idea to actually work on it because we've covered all of the material, believe it or not that you need for it. And the theme for this one obviously is inheritance. And uh, so IT wants you to write some classes for their personal record system, you know, keeping student records maybe. So to make it simple, you want to consider only four classes. And the four classes are person, employee, instructor, and student. So person's going to be your base class. And we've already seen person and student. So we're going to have person, employee, students. You can kind of see where you have instructor who is an employee who is also a person, but they're not really a student. They're employees. So you can call it staff if you want. As I was saying before, you can have your academic freedom to mix and match with the names and stuff like that. But your hierarchy is going to look like that. It's a pretty simple hierarchy. Um, so you probably could be able to create no problem. So the employee class is the parent class of the uh, instructor class here. So uh, the following are your tasks that you need to complete for these particular classes. So you're going to create four classes, obviously, and you're going to use inheritance. You're going to create the appropriate fields for each one of the class. So necessary fields are listed down here. You're going to add your own fields if needed, so you have the uh, freedom put in anything you want. So some fields need to have appropriate constraints. Um, you know, something has to be, you know, a, a, a gender has to be an M or an F. You know, a, a person has to be, a GPA has to be within a certain range or something. Whatever you put in has to have its own constraints. Some fields need to have appropriate constraints. Some uh, use your own judgment uh, for the constraints. So for the person, and here's your four classes actually. And what you're looking at is you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So what are you going to be graded on in this? I'm not going to look at anything outside of, does everything belong in the appropriate class? <laughs> does a person have ID and name? They shouldn't have salary. They shouldn't have student ID. Student ID, excuse me, student as an example, shouldn't have name if it's already in person. So. What you want to do is divide out the functionality so you're not overwriting all of your variables and all your methods. You could do this, and I have had someone already ask me, I could do this all in one class. I know you can do it all in one class. <laughs> but the point is you want to make four classes out of this, use inheritance to specialize the information, specialize the class identity. So you can take a person and ultimately turn them into an instructor. And uh, what you're looking at here, followed before the call, you can call it salary, teacher ID, teacher name. Um, and you can, in fact, you can take, uh, for example, here, you know, person has a, an ID. Well, it's an integer starting from one, should be unique, which means for all people, you can make that static, actually. In fact, you can keep a count just like next ID in the lecture. That's how you're going to keep it unique. So if you think about the logic, you can actually cut your work down. You don't have to do a test. You know, you don't have to have the person actually create their own ID. The program doesn't have to create any IDs. You actually can have the class create their ID. It gets incremented, starts with one. So that's the next ID is going to help you with that in terms of the static uh, variable. The name, okay. <clears throat> so employee is going to have a salary. It's going to be a double. 
should should not be negative. Hopefully, they're making a positive. It could be float if you want to use that. Student, for simplicity, assume that the student has at most one teacher, because you can assign. So we have teacher ID. So students have teachers in terms of they're taking classes with teachers, if you want to turn it, put it that way. It's an integer. It's his or her instructor ID. So zero if no instructor is given. And then we have the teacher name of the teacher and the ID is associated with it. And then we have the instructor, which has a student ID array, because the instructor has more than one student, hopefully. <laughs> No, we didn't get 100 and something, but we have at least 40 something of you. <laughs> so, um, so you'll have to figure out how to use an array if you're brand new. The Deedle and Deedle text, chapter 2, I think, goes into, or chapter 3 goes into arrays, uh, which is not too bad, so it's pretty easy. And you have to figure out how to do an array of objects, uh, which is the same as an array of integers and array of floats. It's, it's kind of the same concept. So the array of student IDs. So this is a, would be an ID that would be stored in a student object of this instructor. So set the array to be 10 initially, all the zeros. If you don't want them to have more than 10, you can actually make them 5. You can specify out how many students you want in there. You want more than one, that's what the point is. All the above fields are private and only accessible through the access method. Same requirement we have in the first assignment. I want your data members to be private. Your accessors, your modifiers are modifying those fields. It applies towards all of your classes. There's no need to make any data member public. Um, a two string method for each class to print out the available information about the current object, converting it to a string. So if the person's class to string is declared as abstract. Um, this is going to be an interesting implementation. I want you to use the abstract method on person because you're making specialized people. One of them is going to be a student, one of them is going to be an employee, which means you're going to have the method body, but you're not going to have the implementation in person. And you're going to have a two string method that's going to print out the information that's associated because each one of these methods is going to be different. If you print out, you know, the information, it's going to be Depending upon which class you've specialized in, you're going to get a student ID, or you're going to get a teacher ID, or you're going to get a list of students when you print out the information that's associated with that particular instance, for that particular class. So static, uh, find students with person, person array, that's the, uh, the array method for the instructor. Um, if you do, okay, so if you get the basis down, that's good. You know, from this, these bottom here are, it would be nice to do this as well. The main part of your grade for your assessment of this is did you create the inheritance? Depending upon your background, you may or may not necessarily, you know, understand how to do the arrays. If you can do the inheritance, you're going to get five out of five points on it. If you can do the rest of it, you're still going to get five out of five points on it, but you're going to actually learn more from the exercise. Because uh, what you're going to end up happening is some of you who are, have a brand new, you've never worked, you never programmed in any language before, you're going to have a problem understanding arrays because in a traditional programming class, how to program in Java, you could spend two or three weeks on the array concept, multiple arrays, single arrays, and then you can spend, you know, so much time on the basic structure, which we're not going to spend because this is not a how to program in Java course. So this particular number, item number four, might actually be kind of uh, challenging for you is what I'm saying. So make a good attempt. Um, so if you don't do it at all, you can, you can fudge it, actually, without using an array at all, is what I'm saying. Uh, so, All right, so we have a, a method to find students. It's uh, going to be filled in by the ob instructor object student array and corresponding student teacher IDs. So you see, see the test program. We have a test program out there that's going to show you the driver. So I've written the driver for you that's going to actually mimic the information that you have to implement in the classes to actually get it to work right. Person should be declared as an abstract class, as I mentioned before, because you're putting an abstract method in the class because you're going to convert that to string. You're going to convert it. You're going to implement the two string differently for each one of the subclass superclasses that are built from it. Excuse me, subclasses that are built from it. Uh, so person's going to be an abstract class. So you're going to provide multiple constructors and methods if needed. 
You don't have to. You're going to check uh, the test.java program. So, and it's not below, it's actually in a separate file. And I, I'll show you where it is. Well, you probably saw it when I was downloading this one to see uh, what actions you need to do. So, you're actually given the driver program and you're just implementing the four classes. So, if a class can use a parent class method and a constructor, use the super call. So, I want you to see if you can use super to call what already exists to set a name, to set an ID or something without reinventing it. And this will reduce the redundant code. When I say reinvent, that's what I mean by redundant code. Make sure the test.java program can work with your class. See the sample output below. And what you're seeing down here is um, basically uh, the, the output uh, from the program. And here's the, actually I put the code down here, that's good. I also put it in a text file that is available out here, it should be. Yep, so assignment two, we have test.java, and then we have sample output, which is the lower part of this assignment here. Um, so I kind of gave, gave you kind of a brief run through. The uh, lecture four, lecture three and four are gonna be very good for uh, your basic understanding. You can do the entire assignment from lecture four, actually. Every, all of the concepts, including the abstract concept, are covered. Here, if you're brand new, you're probably going to need to spend a, f a lot more time on assignment number one. And I highly recommend like investing a lot of time up front. Because once you get the core concept down, core basic concepts, the assignments will run easily after that. Because they're, they're all actually kind of simple, if, if you have experience with it. Now, the problem that it ends up running into is students say they, they rush through number one, they look at number two, and they kind of fake that one. And then they don't learn anything from that point forward. <laughs> because the next ones actually aren't really object oriented. Right, I think, believe that, I think the next one's like on swing or something, and then we look at applets, and then we look at other things. So, really, number one and number two are on your core class object concept. You're creating base classes with number one. Number two is with the inheritance. So that's why I kind of think if you spend a majority of your time working in those two, the rest of it will be easy, actually, because it's a it's like building the foundation of a house. You'll have a lot more skills to work with in terms of going it. And if you're overwhelmed at this point, Deedle and Deedle, how to program in Java, is sure going to be your best resource, actually, because it'll teach you everything you need to know. And you can actually learn how to program in Java and how to do the object-oriented stuff all together. And between now and the next class session, which is going to be in March 19th and 20th, if you have questions, you can always send me an email message. And I've extended this offer out, actually, to the weekday people, and I'll extend it to you as well. As you start writing the code, you're going to have problems if you send me the code, I can point you in the right direction. If it's a simple problem, I'll fix it for you. I'm not going to write everybody's program, though. <laughs> but actually, I've had some students take me up on this already uh, from the weekday program, and they, they're pretty close. So in a lot of cases, it's a typo. It's something you've left out. You know, you've done something in the wrong order. You need to put a word somewhere. You do something. Or maybe it's even a capitalization issue. If I see it, I can probably see it real quickly. If it's an obvious problem, I'll fix it for you. I'll send you back the files. Don't cut and paste the files and put it in an email message. That doesn't really save me any time. Attach the files as file attachments and give me information. Just don't say, hey, it's not working. <laughs> Actually trying to tell me what's not working about it so I know where to look. It's converting everything to, to these weird characters. It's not giving me any output. It's not compiling. It's not doing. Then I can actually kind of see what's going on, and then um, so usually I can catch it pretty quickly. And we'll turn around on it. It's like oh, a day or so, depending upon what day of the week you've got. So, uh, but no, I highly. If you're brand new, I highly encourage you to send me your non-working stuff. And I can fix it for you. So, and again, nothing is due. You should be able to hopefully by the next class session in March, by a month from now. Work through assignments number one and assignments number two. By next class session, I should have the ITU database should be built and ready to go, and you should be able to upload those two. Next class session, I'm going to talk about the midterm and the CSLO essay and assign both of those two assignments out. So you, you do kind of want to get your feet wet and kind of get started. Are there questions? 
At this point, you're just, I want to leave. <laughs> well, then we are done.